master scuba instructor, yacht captain, commercial airline pilot, founder of a nine-figure company. Um, no, I'm not talking about Frank Abingdale, the, the guy from Catch Me If You Can. I'm talking about my guest today, Travis Rossback. He is the founder of Hydro Flask. You may be holding one of those right now. And he is a master storyteller because I, I had three pages of notes and I asked one question to get started. And then it was just off to the races. And I don't think I've laughed this much during a podcast. And, and I and I never looked at my notes again. Um, I had a ball interviewing this guy. And I'll tell you, I I wish he were like a cousin or, or uh, you know, like a, a next door neighbor because he's just that kind of guy. You just want to hang out with him. So you are going to enjoy the next 45 minute ride. And Travis is going to entertain the heck out of you. Enjoy. I have the pleasure of speaking with Travis Rosbach. And Travis has spent the last three decades enhancing his entrepreneurial skills. We're going to talk about that. Throughout the years, he has been a proud inventor and founder of Hydro Flask. Uh, you may be holding one in your hand right now, actually. Um, he's been a business broker, an airline pilot, an active professional speaker, and the creator of the Tomalo Group. And we're going to find out all about that. Um, he has done many things and he advises clients, including uh, celebrities, uh, high worth, high net worth individuals, and, and various industries as well. And he not only shares his tradecraft with others, but also practices it in many startups in which he is currently involved. There is a list, I'm not going to read everyone, but there's a list of about 11 bullet points here of different certifications and different areas in which Travis uh, is an expert and has qualifications. Um, I had just a few minutes before we went live here uh, talking with him, and I am greatly looking forward to this podcast. He's a wonderful guy. So we're going to get started right away. Travis, welcome to the Thrive More podcast. Well, thank you, Roger. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So I would love to know, um, you've got a very unique story, and you've just done, I mean, when I read your bio, it's, it's almost like you've just, you've designed the life you want to live. If, if, you know, I'm, I don't want to put words in your, in your mouth, but can you talk a little bit about your, your, I guess, process or the, the way that you've created your life? Because there is literally a list of 11 different bullet points here on all the things that you've become certified in or an airline pilot or scuba, um, Reiki, like all these things. And I would love to know how did that all start? But, you know, were you always like this as a, as a child and always into different things or when did that blossom? It all started. <laughs> I would <laughs> say that I, at a very early age, I, I was always really restless. I, I grew up in Salem, Oregon. It, it rains mm -hmm. a lot in the Willamette Valley. I was grounded a lot. And so I read a lot of books, choose your own adventure, watched a yeah. lot of Jacques Cousteau and a lot of, uh, a lot of my time was spent outdoors riding bicycles when I could and, and, and going on adventures. You know, I'm a, a, a Gen Xer and I could, you know, I could ride my bike across town at, at eight years old and 10 years old, you sure. know, and, and sure. not have to worry about that. And then I met my dad for the first time when I was 14 and he happened to be down in the U S Virgin islands in St. Croix and owned scuba diving shops. And so I became open water certified at 14 and got to go see what Jacques Cousteau was showing on Sunday night, ABC. I got to actually wow. go do that in real life. Yeah. And, and from there I realized that I want to spend my life doing things that other people pay to do and things that I want to do. Spending a lot of time at the dive shop. We had a lot of people who, were on vacation and they would complain for the first week about their life and how just awful their jobs were and their marriages were and their children were, and they would complain, complain, complain. Second week they would relax, they would enjoy themselves and then they'd get ready to go back up to New York or back up to the States. And you know, their vacation was over a few days before they left. And I never wanted that. I never wanted to have that mm. life where I'm only on vacation for about four days out of two weeks. And I wanted to go and make money doing things that other people paid to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it said, you said you met your dad for the first time at 14. Just, um, 
was that, did your parents just not live together? Or what, like that's, the, is there a story behind that? Cause that's interesting that he's down in the Virgin islands and, and then you get on when you're 14. Yeah. Well, yeah. What happened was, uh, uh, in, in Turner, Oregon, there's a place mm-hmm. called Willamette Valley Vineyards, which is now mm-hmm. a, a very well-known, uh, wine, what is it yeah. called? A wine company, I guess a, a vineyard. Yeah. And we actually owned that property. I was born at the hospital, but we, that's, that's where I was born at, at that property. And my grandpa had built it, um, had, had bought it and was building it out to be a vineyards. And people told him he was crazy. You cannot grow <laughs> wine in the Willamette Valley. It, it, you know, it's France. That's where wine is. Yeah. It's over in <laughs> Europe, not Willamette Valley, Oregon, it's not Turner, not Salem. And, uh, So he, um, right after I was born or not much longer after I was born, my mom and dad divorced and, and they sold that property to, to who later became Willamette Valley Vineyards. And my dad was gone. He took off and, and he ended up in, uh, uh, hurricane Hugo struck in 88 and he was, uh, in the keys and Mm -hmm. he heard about this place called St. Croix and they needed roofers. And so he went down to do roofing in, uh, St. Croix and, um, I, you know, I had no contact with him whatsoever. And then all of a sudden I got a knock at the door and, uh, there was my grandpa and he says, Hey, you want to go meet your dad? He's in St. Croix. I was like, I, you know, I don't know what that means, but, uh, sure. I thought it was somewhere over near Africa somewhere. I was like, yeah, <laughs> sure. Let's, let's go do that. And yeah. so, uh, you know, I was on the next plane out and, you know, dad, Travis, all right, let's go. And, and wow. Next day I was scuba diving and, and just fell madly in love with being under the water and, and running the dive shop and, and working yeah. in it and living that life of, you know, sort of the, you know, Caribbean soul. Yeah. Did you, did you end up staying in St. Croix for a while then? I, I did. Yeah. I started, um, you know, I started just a couple weeks on and, and off, you know, over yep. Thanksgiving or out over spring mm-hmm. break. And then I started going down over the summers. I'd always come back to Salem. I tried to go to school and, and finish high school in, in St. Croix, but I didn't have good enough grades, believe it or not, to, to graduate. Wow. So I had to come back to Salem to graduate uh, South Salem High School class in 97. And right after, I think it was two days after high school. I was right back down in the, in, in the Virgin islands, predominantly St. Croix, but my dad and I would get into fights and I'd take off to St. Thomas and and work in St. John and, um, had good, good people over there, uh, Bob and Anne Marie at low key water sports. And then I got my cap, you know, I got, uh, certified as a dive master and then a dive instructor. And then I ended up with a 50 ton U S merchant Marine captain's license. Oh my gosh. So, how do how do we go from you're hopping all over the Virgin Islands, which I, I've I've been to um, St. John, Nevis, and and St. Thomas, and they're it's just gorgeous, just gorgeous. I mean, absolutely beautiful. It's almost surreal. I love um, Nevis. How do you go from there? Oh, beautiful. How do you go from there, Travis, to creating Hydro Flask, which is a worldwide brand? I mean, it's a mega brand. Um, how do we get from here? And, and then we'll go back and kind of fill in some gaps because I want to hear about your whole journey. But you know, people um, know you most famously probably for for Hydro Flask because it's such a a popular brand. What caused you to even ideate that, create that? I would love to hear that story. I'm sure the listeners would love to hear the story and the genesis of that. It, it, well, there are a lot of little things that kind of added up to Hydro Flask, but I. Okay one of the big things was when I was about 12, my next door neighbor died and he was very wealthy. He, he had a lot of money. We, we could tell cause he had a fancy car and he wore suits and there were beautiful women going in and out of his house. And <laughs> we lived literally next door, single mom, four kids eating government cheese. The, the government, the Salvation Army would show up and give us a block of actual cheese. It's awful, awful stuff, but it's a real thing. Reagan administration. And, and so I always wondered like, how is it that that guy is so successful and we're eating government cheese and we're 30 feet apart. 
And when he died, it was the first time we went into his house and his sister said, Travis, you can have anything you want in the house. And there was all kinds of beautiful art and fancy watches and, you know, really cool stuff. But there was a bookshelf at the top of the stairs and I'll never forget it. It was like the, the lights turned on, the angels were singing and there were, you know, butterflies and cherubs and it was just amazing. And I was like, I was instantly drawn to that bookshelf and got up and looked at it. And and she gave me the whole bookshelf with all the books. And it was business books, Brian Tracy, Jim Rohn, Zig Ziglar, self-help yeah. Wayne Dyer, a lot of the eighties and early, early nineties. Who's who of business negotiation, yeah. marketing, branding, success, like, and and again, back to being grounded a lot and spending a lot of time in, in my room when it's pouring down rain, I just poured through those books and I saw it as like a choose your own adventure. If I, I knew that if I could get into business, I could kind of create my own path. I don't have to be an attorney like that guy was, but I can also maybe have some of what he has, some of that pizzazz and just that swagger that he had that we didn't have eating government cheese. And so I was, I was always very drawn to business and I, and I always had a big passion for it. And so a couple of years later when I met my dad and he says, I've got a dive shop. Okay, cool. So I'm in the dive shop. We're making money. We're losing money. We're getting robbed. We're buying stuff from the vendors, you know, like all of that. And we're going to the bank. We're going to the post office kind of growing up in that was, I got to practice it and I got to study it. You know, like dad, Brian Tracy says you shouldn't do it that way. And you're like, I don't know who Brian Tracy is, but this is the way we do it. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it wouldn't. And sure. so I was always very interested in business, but I kind of put it on the back burner as I was a, a, a diver and, and a, a boat captain. And, and then I became an airline pilot and jet charters and stuff like that. And then fast forward, I was in Hawaii. I owned a, a sign and banner company and uh, with, with my girlfriend at that time. And um, I was thirsty. And I went in to get a, a Nalgene water bottle from my rock climbing days. I knew about Nalgene. And the whole wall was empty. And, and, and I said, hey, what happened? And they said, well, it's this stuff. We're not really sure. It's called BPA or you know some new thing nobody's ever heard of. It's probably not a big deal. And I said, well, who's going to fill up this wall? You know, who's going to replace these bottles? And they said, nobody, there's, there's nobody else doing water bottles. And it, Roger, it hit me in the back of the head. It came out my mouth. I will, I will do that. <laughs> and the guy laughed. And when he laughed and, and right as I, after I'd said it and right before he laughed, I saw myself 10 years in the future up on stage in a funny, goofy suit and tie and and up on stage talking about this highly successful water bottle company and uh you're being you're being like, dead okay, serious well, right I now i don't but... lie but i don't know anything about water bottles but now i'm doing a water bottle company so i guess i got to do that wow like you let you literally fast forwarded in your mind and saw yourself as a successful it entrepreneur hit. with this water wow it was like uh written. It was, it really was divine. Like yeah. I, you know, collective conscious group consciousness was it God. Was it, um, you know, a flash of inspiration, call it whatever. I still don't know exactly what it was, but it, I saw the future. And then my biggest problem at that point was 10 years. Now I have to work for the next 10 years to describe what I see. And, and I have yeah. to convey to everybody around me my vision. And, and so that, that, I mean, that's kind of what I did for the next 10 years was, was just kind of tell people what I'm seeing is going to happen. I, I would, it would be awesome to hear you talk about, so you walk out of this rock climbing store and what what happens next so you have this, this 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 moment where you have pure clarity for the future but then you walk out of the store what happens next uh, well i went back to the sign company 
and it was it was really cool. We we were working with uh, MMA was just coming out mm-hmm. in Hawaii, and it was just kind of coming yeah. out. And uh, I saw one of your other guests. Her uncle was an MMA. Uh, I think he was a promoter. And, and we used to work with all those, those people, those yeah. guys and gals and, and print banners and t-shirts and we helped build their brands because it was a new yeah. thing. And, and we were about a, a block and a half from the Blaisdell, the um, Coliseum where the, where the fights were and where the, the yeah. trade shows were. And I went in and I asked the, um, the employees, I said, Hey, uh, water bottles. What, you know, what do you guys know about water bottles? They were young and hip and cool. And they, the first one said, SIG, you, you got to get a SIG. It's, it's the only water bottle you ever need. And it's, it's just awesome. I said, okay, great. And I thought, okay, cool. Cause now I can stay with Oahu signs and screen printing. We're doing fairly well. I don't have to start a water bottle company. There is in fact, another company. So I bought a SIG and I can say SIG without any qualms because I now know the the factory and I know those guys and uh, yeah. <laughs> they, uh, you know, they were like 20 bucks and it was a lot of money for a water bottle and sure. it was aluminum. I dropped it, it dented and I noticed that the inside had flaked off. I didn't know what happened to it. I called SIG in New York and I said, Hey, what's this gold stuff? You know, what, what happened? Where, you know, what, what did I just, just ingest? And they were really rude. They didn't want to talk to me. They didn't want to answer my questions. And I thought, you know, this is no way to have customer service. And so if this is the best of the best, this isn't very good. And then I talked to my brother here in Oregon. He just started at REI. It just opened up in Bend. Mm. And he said, um, clean canteen is, is a water bottle company. I said, Oh great. Now I don't have to do a water bottle company because somebody's (laughs) already doing it. So I bought a clean canteen and it was single wall and, uh, no offense, but you know, it's ergonomically incorrect. Every time I take a sip, it would dribble down my shirt and I, you know, I'd lose half of it and I'd look like an idiot and I'd take it out. I'd put it on the beach, go surf, come back. It'd be too hot to drink. I'd come back to Oregon. I'd hike to the top of bachelor and my water would be frozen. And so I, I thought, well, um, I actually have it right up here, but my grandpa used to have this old school thermos, you know, he'd put his coffee in it and it weighed 800 yeah. pounds and it stunk <laughs> and it, it just looks awful, not practical whatsoever. But I thought, well, why can't we take that same technology instead of glass? Could we use metal and, mm-hmm. and put the two together and make it into a bottle that we could, you know, before the term everyday carry, but how do we everyday yeah. care? How do we make something that people want to actually keep with them? And, yeah. um, so that's kind of how it started. And then, so did you go find uh, a company to make a prototype? Like how, how does, how does it go from, okay, I want to take the thermos technology, but modernize it and create this everyday carry category, which really didn't exist back then. How did you go from that to a working prototype? Well, um, at the sign company, we had a client who would go to the Canton fair in China every year and he would help his clients find factories to work with to create products. And so I, you know, Hey, this is great. All I have to do is ask him to go to China to the Canton fair done. And he laughed and he's like, no, there's no such thing. Like nobody's doing that. You you can't come with me. I said, well, let me just come with, and then like, I'm going to pay you. I'll come with you. And, and I'll go, I'll walk around and I'll find somebody. And he goes, no, like, that's just stupid. You No, I don't even want your money. Nobody's doing that. And, and so I thought, well, somebody has to be doing something like that. <laughs> and so I found a water bottle company. I mean, this is early days of Google. And I was a bit of a yeah. Neanderthal. I still am when they, you know, what, what's the, um, I don't know. There's some fancy word for lack of computer intelligence, but uh, neophyte. And I, we somehow found a water bottle company that said, oh yeah, we, we do that. We do double wall vacuum insulated. Yeah, no problem. Just come on over. Oh, great. So sold surfboards and mopeds and took off to Shanghai and showed up in Shanghai and managed to find the factory and managed to, to you know, 
figure out what building it was and got inside and said, Hey, I'm here to, to, to look at your double wall vacuum insulated bottles. And I said, Oh no, we don't do that. We do plastic. And I said, no, 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 look at your fax. You know, I had the fax with me and I, right here it says insulated. Oh yeah, no, we don't do that. I was like, I, I just sold my moped and my longboard to come here because it says here on this fax that you do insulated water bottles. Oh no, not us. I said, well, is this your company? Yeah. Is this your address? Yeah. Am, am I in the right building? Yeah. Yeah. We do plastic. You should buy plastic. Nobody does insulated bottles. It's like, oh, well, you know, dang it. Now I'm in China <laughs> with not a lot of money left to my name. And, but hey, at least, you know, I had the, 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 um, the sign company to go home to. And I, I was, I was kind of pissed uh, to tell you the truth. I was, yeah. I was a little upset. Start to leave and somebody came up and grabbed my arm and he says, hey, I have a cousin in Hangzhou who might be able to help you. I was like, I don't even know what that means. But at this point, <laughs> like I am here for another nine days. And so today's day number one. And I have no idea what I'm doing or where I am or what's going on. And so he wrote down train station and Hanjo on two pieces of paper. And I went out and grabbed the next taxi and I gave him the one that said Hanjo. And the guy goes, no, 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 no. It's like, dang it. Now I can't even get to Hanjo. How about this one? And he goes, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So he takes me <laughs> to the train station. I give him the one that says Hanjo because I know I'm now at the train station. Yeah. I show up in Hanjo at the train station and realize, oh, great. Now I'm in a city of like 8 million people. And I don't know who I'm – like I don't know homie's cousin. Like I'm here by myself. I don't know who this dude is. Uh, and I, I was literally going down the escalator thinking, what, like – what am I doing, Travis? What have you got yourself into now? Like what you have no place to stay. You don't really have any money left. And now you're just in Hanjo looking for some dude's cousin. And, um, so that was kind of a sinking feeling to tell you the truth. Yeah. I got oh. to the bottom of the escalator. It was a long ass escalator. And, um, luckily I was the only white guy and this lady came up and she's like, you must be Travis. And it's like, yeah. How, you know, like, how did you know? Well, uh, you're the only white guy. There's 6 million people and you're the only white guy. Well, you know, there might've been three in the whole city, sure. but, uh, she said, yeah, my, my husband's cousin told us that you may be coming to Hanjo. So I've been hanging out waiting for you. I'm like, Oh, oh my cool. Gosh. We, you know, you guys make double wall vacuum insulated water balls. And she goes, no, <laughs> well, that's why I'm here. Like I'm four hours south of Shanghai now, and and now you're telling me no. She goes, Yeah, no, we don't do that. I said, well, then what are we doing? She says, Well, I don't know. And so she took me to the office, and I, you know, introduced me to her husband, and he's like, Yeah, well, we'll we'll go find somebody who can do it. So the next day, we we spent another four hours on a train going into another part of China. And spent the next seven days getting told no repeatedly. Nobody does that. That's stupid. Nobody was interested and uh, rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected. And then right before I was set to go back to Shanghai and fly out, the very last place we went, this guy kind of smiled and he, he kind of looked at me like, you're crazy, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they said, well, if you can make this machine that can make that part, then we could maybe use that to put into that, which could be that. And then maybe I was like, cool, I'll take the maybe. <laughs> so went back home to Hawaii with a, a maybe. And then about six months later, we got two prototypes and, uh, and we were, we were off. Wow. That is a great story. That is a great story. That's that's not taking no for an answer and just persevering, but also just probably being in an age too where you didn't know enough to not know enough. You know what I mean? Like just like yeah, just going for it. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. I didn't have the schooling or the knowledge to 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 understand that, you know, this this should not work at this point, Travis. You didn't have any limiting beliefs. That's beautiful. That's that's entrepreneurship. No limiting beliefs. Hey everyone, as you know, I don't have any advertisements nor sponsorships on this podcast. My only ask of you, the listener, 
is that you share this podcast with someone that you know, a friend, a family member, a coworker, or a colleague who may benefit from this information, may benefit from today's guest, from the value that they're, they're sharing with the audience, with you, the listener. When you share this podcast and our audience grows, it allows me to book more and more guests who have a great message, great nuggets of wisdom that you can benefit from. And again, your network can benefit from. So please right now, push that share button, send it to somebody that you care about. And let's get back to the interview. So you get your two prototypes and then what happens next? Well, we were in Honolulu and so, um, had to build a website because that's what people yeah. were starting to do. You need to get a yeah. website. Okay. Well, we need photographs. Okay. Uh, found a buddy who was a, a professional photographer for, for surfing magazines and stuff. And he's going to hook us up with a really great deal, great package. He's going to do all the photography. And so we waited a couple of weeks. He gets us the proposal and it was like, like $20,000 <laughs> to do <laughs> photo shoot of these two bottles. And so went to Costco, bought a camera, read the manual, went down to Waikiki, found beautiful people, handed them the bottle, took pictures of beautiful people with the bottles and, and, um, built a website. And, um, at, at that point, uh, everybody that we gave the two samples to, they didn't want to give us the samples back. We mm-hmm. told them, Hey, you know, that we would put ice cubes inside of them and they yeah. would hold them and they'd be like, Whoa, I don't feel it's not cold. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so we could go surf. Exactly. I, okay. This is mine. Nope. That's mine. <laughs> Please give it back. And so that was kind of all the, the confirmation that we needed that, okay, this is going to work. Like I'm not the only one who wants it. There's at least eight other people who are going to want these. (laughs) And so we sold every single piece of everything that we owned, moved back home to Bend, Oregon, uh, moved, moved in with my mom and bought 5,000 bottles. Wow. And and your goal was to sell direct or to get into stores with it? My goal was to just build a cool water bottle. <laughs> like I just wanted to have a cool bottle that I could go hike up bachelor. <laughs> and I figured, you know, I could probably find 4,999 other people who wanted to maybe buy one. And, um, you know, that was, it was like a, a hypothesis that I had that sure. other people might want this also. Yeah. All right. So you get, um, I'm, I'm loving this, Travis. This is, this is, like a, a, uh, a master class in entrepreneurship and just following your vision. So you get five, you order 5,000 bottles, you, you scrape together all your money, sell your stuff, you move back home, you get 5,000 bottles from that, I would imagine from that uh, factory in China, the last factory that you visited in China. Yep. And those get shipped to the state. Have you sold, pre-sold any before they get shipped to the States or is it all you front the whole thing? No, actually, we actually ran out of money <laughs> before the 5,000 shipped. And so we couldn't even afford the 5,000 because we did not take into consideration that we have to buy airplane tickets to come back to Bend. And so we ran out of money and couldn't afford the 5,000. I convinced the, uh, the, the guy I'd met in Hanjo, uh, his yep. name's Michael, Michael Yao, convinced him to, you know, Hey, can we get 2,500 instead? And, and then we'll, you know, buy the other 2,500 later. And he, and he said, you know, Travis, uh, nobody's ever going to buy the 2,500 that you buy anyway. And so fine. Yeah. Just take 2,500. You're never going to sell them. I'm never going to recoup this. It's going to be a complete loss. I made a mistake and now you're just adding insult to injury. Go ahead. (laughs) Just take them. So we got 2,500 and, um, had no real clear vision on how to like hawk a water bottle. Like how do you <laughs> pitch a water bottle? Nobody's, nobody's walking around drinking out of water bottles. And so the only thing I could really think of was the Portland Saturday market up in Portland, Oregon, uh, under the Burnside bridge. And, So we went up to the Portland Saturday market and showed them, Hey, you know, we got these water bottles and we want to sell them. 
And they said, no, you, you can't, nobody, you can't sell water. The Pepsi guy is selling water. And they're like, no, 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 there's no water in them. It's, they're just water bottles. And they're like, no, the Pepsi guy sells water. You can't sell water. There's no water in them. They're just the bottles. And the lady's like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Who's going to walk around carrying a water bottle with them? And so instead of letting us sell inside of the Portland Saturday market, she says, you know what? Just go out by the railroad track and, and go sell them over there and see what happens. I was like, okay, so if we go set up over there, you're not going to call the police. And she's like, yeah, fine, just go set up by the railroad tracks, <laughs> the max uh, rail system. And I was stoked. I was like, okay, cool. Put up a little card table and, and, you know, and from the sign company days, you know, we had access to cool products. Like we had business cards and brochures yeah. and a table throw. Yeah. And so we, and we had t-shirts, like we knew how to brand ourselves. And so yeah. we always, from day one, branded it. Like this is hydro flask. Like, obviously, you know who hydro flask is, but it's hydro flask <laughs> and, and it worked, you know, people are like, what's that? Oh, it's a hydro flask. looks like a water bottle. Mm, yeah, no, this is a hydro flask actually. And sure enough, like, you know, like five or six people the first day bought them. And I was stoked because it paid the lady who ended up wanting money because even though it was on the railroad track, she still wanted to charge us for it. And, you know, I thought I was a success, you know, and then the following week, uh, people were coming back and they're like, Hey, we want to buy another one. It actually works. Okay, cool. We sold a couple more the next weekend. And then the next weekend they had lined up past her office around the corner and she came out and she was yelling and screaming at people. What are you doing? Oh, we're buying hydro flasks. What's that? Oh, it's these water bottles. That's stupid. And she got all pissed. <laughs> And, and then the next weekend, same thing happened where they were lined up past her shop to buy more hydro flasks. So finally she's like, all right, fine, come inside. Come so inside. she let us have a booth inside the, it's still outdoors and, you know, under the yeah. uh, tent pouring down rain, Portland, Oregon. Um, so we did that and, and had a great time throwing water bottles and, and catching cash. Wow. Wow. So how does it go from you're in a Portland weekend market? How does it go from that to, I guess, the next step in, in distribution? Because at some point, it, it it had to, like any great product, it it almost starts to go viral, and and, and you know it's a hockey stick in growth. Wh where was the where was the inflection point from the market to you know where it's it's kind of ubiquitous? Well, springtime came. Or, or more into the summer uh, in, here in Bend is, is called uh, Munch and Music down at the Drake Park. And so we set up a booth kind of like the Saturday market where vendors set up and there's music yep. and face painting and, and, you know, corn dogs and stuff. And a guy came and it was a slow week at the Bend Bulletin newspaper. And he said, Hey, you know, uh, I don't really have anything else going on. Can I do an article on you guys? I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. So we do an article on that. I think it was a Thursday. The following Thursday, we're back at Munch and Music because we'd sold you know, a fair few bottles. And a guy came up and he says, hey, I'm a sales rep. I saw you in the newspaper. Can I be your sales rep? And I, I didn't even know what that meant, you know, because I knew what <laughs> scuba diving sales reps meant, you know, like, yeah, you go sure. around, you sell dive gear to dive shops. But, you know, I don't understand why, you, you know, what are you doing with water bottles? And he says, well, I'll sell the water bottles into sporting goods stores. Oh, that, that makes a lot of good sense. And so we gave him, and so by this time we we're running pretty low on the 2,500 and we we're about ready yeah. to buy the second 2,500 to, you know, the five grand. And, um, he's like, I need 48 bottles. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think we can give you that many. Cause I don't even know you. And that, you know, that's scary. Here's 24. Yeah. And, uh, that was on a Thursday, the back up to Portland Saturday market and pretty much sold through the rest of the 2,500 Monday he calls and he's like, how many do you have left? I'm like 300. And he goes, those are mine. I said, what do you mean? Those are yours. He's like, I sold them. I said, to who? He's like, oh, you know, to this little mom and pop shop and this. And so I, it, it dawned on me like, oh, okay, yeah, we need to get into retail stores. Duh. Yep, yeah. I mean, yep. like that makes perfect sense. 
So we ordered the twenty five, the second twenty five hundred. They came. I have to stop you right there, Travis. So you, I just have to hear. So you call the guy in China, Michael in China, yeah. who said, "I'll never hear from you again." I just have to yeah. I hear. I just have to be a fly in the wall when you call him and say, "I actually need those next twenty five hundred. Like, how did you react to that? It it it, it wasn't like I told you so because I didn't want to be a jerk yeah. about it, but it was yeah. kind of like. Hey, you know, like I told you so, you know, because I told him, I said, look, you make them, I'll sell them. Don't worry about yep. me selling them. You just worry about yep. making them because that was the hardest part was figuring out sure. who and how they could be made. And he's like, okay, fine. You know, like I was just getting ready to take them in for the scrap and, and, and scrap them. So like you're, I was, I was within hours of him taking them to the scrap yard <laughs> and, and collecting money on that. And so when they reached, went and picked him up and I went into, the first thing I did was I went into Whole Foods here in Bend and um, I said, Hey, you know, I got this water bottle and they're like, Oh, go talk to the, you know, Sarah. I go back and talk to Sarah and she's like, yeah, we're not buying any more water brands. We've got, you know, all of these, you know, this whole shelf is filled with water. I'm like, no, no, there's no water in it. They're just <laughs> bottles. They're like, she's like, there's no such thing. Like nobody's doing that. So they send me all around the store and finally they said, Oh, Evan, you got to go talk to Evan. So I go back over to this one little area. I see this man laying on the ground and he's, he's pissed. He's, he's just livid and he's down on the ground and he's, he's pulling these things out. And I see that they're SIG bottles and SIG had come out that they had BPA in them. And, yeah. and sure enough, when I called and asked, what's this gold stuff? Uh, they, you know, that's a whole other story that I don't want to get down sure. that road, but basically they lied. So he's pulling them off the shelf and he's like, who are you? What are you doing here? I said, well, I'm Travis from Hydro Flask and I've got the replacement for the SIG. He goes, well, how many do you have? And I'm thinking, oh, I've got 2,500. And I said, well, you know, we've got I think we had like four colors. He goes, all right, I'll take two cases of each. Like, done. And so left Evan with that order, went across yeah. town to Newport Market, met Joe. Hey, Joe, Newport or uh, Whole Foods just bought two cases of each. He goes, okay, I'll buy three cases of each. Done. Sell Joe three cases of each. Go to the next crunchy food store that's not in business anymore. And hey, you know, Whole Foods, Newport Market. Okay, fine. We'll take one case of each. Done. Well, there go the 2,500, you know? And yeah. so, um, at, you know, once we had Whole Foods, it, it made, it, it just gave us a, like a lot more clout. We could just sure, say sure. Whole Foods and people like, Good enough for them. Good enough for me. <laughs> I don't think yeah. that they do that anymore uh, where they take on localized products, which I think is yeah. a real shame, but um, I don't know for sure. So, Yeah, I've heard, actually, I've heard, uh, I, I interviewed the founder of Hint, Kira Golden, uh, Hint, Hint Water, and she had the same thing going into Whole Foods, talking to a local guy in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area. That's how that whole brand started because they used to take, they would take a chance on, on, on a yeah. local person, which was, which was really cool. So then, so Whole Foods, and then is that, do you, do you believe that was really the inflection point for getting the distribution? Uh, Cause you could, you know, you could anchor with Whole Foods and then other people would take it on. And I guess the you know, next question would be what, what happened to the sales rep that was selling the 300 and, and his story? Well, so he says, you need to come to outdoor retail show in Salt Lake city. Yep. Okay. I know what, um, you know, dive shows are in Orlando, Dima, um, sounds like the same thing. Okay, cool. And then we get the, the bill for it. And it's like, Whoa, that's how much it costs. Well, we can't afford a booth. So we got some, uh, bamboo and built this like rickety makeshift bamboo, uh, booth. And we were put way in the back of the trade show and it was just quiet. Nobody was interested. Nobody really cared what was going on. And then the hot lights from inside the, the um, convention center dried out the bamboo and it would crack and it sounded like gunshots. And so all of a sudden it boom, boom, like it would crack just like a gunshot. Like I've been shot at before and it, it sounded like a gunshot <laughs> and it would echo. 
and it echo not only in our hall, but it would echo throughout the rest of the building. People are thinking there's, you know, they're we're popping off rounds. So people are ducking and running and, and, but, and then, you know, of course security comes up and no, no, it's just, you know, it's just these jackasses back there selling water bottles. And so then everybody had to go see who these jackasses were popping off rounds or selling water bottles or what's going on back there. And that brought people back to us. And, uh, you know, where do you sell whole foods? Oh, okay. You know, and we had maybe a a handful of, um, you know, sporting goods stores at that time, but then the sales reps came and, um, you know, they multiplied like rabbits at that point, yeah. you know, we, we give them 24, they'd take them home and they'd sell 84 and, yeah. uh, 84 would turn into 164 and it would just, it just started going and going and going. And next thing we knew we were doing 40 to 40,000 a month, uh, within, Holy moly. within the first year or so. And then, and then got up to about 80,000 a month. And, uh, it was just incredible. And did you stay with the same Chinese manufacturer that entire run for that first year? No, we no, had to change factories two or three times. And yeah. um, some of the factories were better. Like we, we ended up doing the very first growler, um, 64 ounce, uh, you know, technically beer growler, but I, yeah. I don't drink beer. So it was water. And, um, you know, so there's one factory that said, hey, you know, we see that it's a, it's a town called Yin Kong or Jin Hua. There's these two towns next to each other that do metal. And once they started to see the factory, this one factory starts to hire more people and they're doing better and they got a new sign and they painted their building and they were making <laughs> money. Pretty soon other people wanted to get these vacuums and they started yeah. doing vacuum yeah. insulation. And so we started picking up more and more um, factories. Yeah. Wow. And then so, and I should know, but I don't, um, did you eventually exit Hydroflax? Did, did, did it, did you sell it? Is, is it still yours? How did that? Yeah, no, I, I, um, I, I kept going and my partner eventually, she kind of, um, faded away and, uh, we, we brought on an, an investor, uh, sure. luckily, cause there was no way, I mean, it was 500 to 750,000 a month to, to yeah. just make them let alone pay yep. staff and every all the other expenses. And um, it just kept going and going and going. And then I got to the point where we were in all of the stores that I could ever imagine. And we were doing everything. You know, I had, I had plans for <laughs> the Yeti tumbler. Um, I had, I had all <laughs> these patents and I had all these different things that I could ever imagine. And I, I kind of like, the best way I can describe it is the season was over. Like I just, Mm. I realized, you know, I'm tired of living in the hotels. I'm tired of, you know, traveling as much as I was, which I love to travel, which is saying a lot, but living in hotels and at trade shows and um, all of that, I was just kind of done with it. And once the decision was made to go corporate and, and eventually go on to where it is now, I, I, I wanted nothing to do with that. I, that's not, yeah. that's not me. So I exited. Yeah. Yeah. Success story though. Wow. Like I, uh, one, I don't know if I've laughed as much interviewing somebody on this show. Just your storytelling is awesome, but I love that oh, you cheers. kept hearing the, the, yeah, the, the, the repeated, that's a dumb idea. That'll never work. You know, it says everyone until they realize, oh my gosh, that's genius. You know, like every, yeah. everybody that's ever had come out with a cool product have been told you're stupid. That's not going to work. It won't make any money until it does. And then it's blatantly obvious why it was so successful, you know, but it's, it's getting yeah. through all those no's to get to the yes. I love that. I love that. All right. So we have to thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. Cause that's one that's inspirational, but it's also educational because that is a case study in, in how to do it. Um, all right, so I'm just going to rattle off some of these things, and I would love for you just to touch on these. All right, so you talked about being a, a, a scuba dive um, uh, master, like master instructor, um, U.S. merchant marine boat captain, a commercial airline pli- pilot. You were a realtor, you're a yoga instructor, a Reiki master, um, member of the Explorers Club. You'll have to explain to me what that is, and a fellow at the Royal Geographical Society. 
just touch on some of those because I know there's more, but those were the ones I, I grabbed for the notes. Like one <laughs> commercial airline pilot. Like why why did you choose to get your commercial airline license? Well, well, I was I was on a yacht. Um, I was a I got my 50 ton U.S. Merchant Marine boat captain's license because I I mean I grew up on dive boats and sure. parasail boats and I traveled all over the world in the off season when it's summer in the Virgin Islands. People don't want to go where it's hot. You know, it's hot in New York. They don't want to go to the Virgin Islands when it's hot. So it's very yeah. slow in the summertime. And so in the summers, I'd take off and I'd travel and I'd, I'd go work as a boat captain in Australia or, you know, wherever in the world I was. So I had all this boat experience, boating experience. So I got my captain's license to run the dive boats predominantly for my dad, but also um, ended up, you know, we'd get into a fight. I got on a yacht. And, um, the captain was like, Hey, I want you to take over my captain's job. And I was like, well, that sounds great, but I don't want to live on this yacht. And I don't want to like, it was great pay. And it was a very, you know, sexy, glamorous lifestyle, but I like that is your life is on that yeah. 100 foot yacht. And so I said, no, I quit on the spot. I'm walking down the gangplank and I was like, gangplank and I was like, dang, what am I going to do now? And right then a seaplane took off up out of the ocean, like right next to me. And I was like, I'm a, I'm a pilot. That's what I do. I, I fly airplanes. I fly those things. And, and I had like 1500 bucks to my name and got back to my apartment. My landlord is like, Hey, you owe me $800 for rent since you've been gone. And so they rent most of my money. And, um, but I became an airline pilot over 9-11 and oh my went back and, and flew the uh, seaplanes for Seaborne Airlines, ended up flying uh, uh, jet charters out of Florida, Lears and Hawkers and Falcons and things like that, and had a lot of fun doing, doing flying. Wow. Wow. Um, it's I'm, I can't help but... Um although you've done it for real, but I, I can't help but think of Frank Abagnale, the, 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 uh, catch yeah, me if you can yeah, character, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> just, yeah, yeah. just these stories I, that you're telling. I'm like, my God. Oh, I love it. Um, well, let me ask you a couple last questions here. I mean, I could, I literally could talk to you all day. If I, I love like when you started off your story and, and, and you said you were, you know, all the stuff in the house and all the, the watches and the art, and you were drawn to those books. Um, that, that touched my heart because I'm an avid reader. People that listen to this show know I'm an avid reader. And, uh, I once in my early twenties taught, uh, uh, when I was first starting my career, just to get back, I, I, I helped, um, uh, a, a young man, uh, young Hispanic man who couldn't read, couldn't read period, um, taught him how to read and it was an, an adult literacy program. And when I watched him, you know, read the newspaper, or, you know, you read something, an article in time magazine, whatever it was. I could, ju I literally watched it in front of my eyes. The world opened up to him. Like once you can read, you can learn anything you can learn. Like you, the world is now open to you. And when you can't read, you know, it's, it's pretty close. Uh, so I guess that, that, that experience just changed my life forever. Um, so I always ask guests, is, is there a book that you've read? Uh, and you mentioned, you know, uh, Brian Tracy and Zig Ziglar. Is there a book that you've read that you would recommend to the audience that, you know, when they would set it down, just like when you set it down, it had a profound impact on you. And, you know, this, this profound impact where you set it down, you said, man, my, my life is different for having read that book. Is there one that you could name? It, that's always the hardest question for me. I mean, I've got, I've got a few books <laughs> and sure. this is only yeah. a part of it. Sure. I think the only thing worse than not being able to read is, is not actually reading, you know, cause it, it would be one thing to not be able to, but to not actually read. And as much as I, I do enjoy YouTube, um, TikTok, YouTube, social media has robbed a lot of time that, that probably should have been spent reading instead. Agreed. I think that every time I've been in a situation, like when I was a pilot, it was the right stuff. I learned how yep. to be a pilot first and then I learned how to fly airplanes. A lot of people did it opposite where they learned to fly yeah. an airplane because they wanted to go be a pilot for the airlines. 
I first learned how to be a pilot and then I went backwards and learned how to fly airplanes and, and the right stuff was that book for me that taught me to be a pilot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Business, you know, the millionaire mind, the millionaire next door, mm -hmm. Brian Tracy, um, negotiation, you know, I've, I've been in multiple points of my life where I am like, Oh dang, what do I do? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm kind of in trouble. Like I, I don't know yeah. what to do. And a book will <clears throat> jump off the shelf. Somebody will say, Oh, have you read that book? Like, duh, that's what you need, Travis. You just need to read that <laughs> book. And I read the book. I'm like, yeah, duh, that is the book. And yeah. so it, and, and so not knowing where people are in their journey or where they're stuck, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to answer that. Like, I don't know how to advise you which book you need to read right now. But I do know that the idiots guides, the, the dummies guides, you know, like nonprofit quantum physics, which hasn't really done me any good um, consulting <laughs> Buddhism. These are just the ones I have, but I have rock climbing, boat captaining, flying, how to make a million dollars. All of those idiots guides have given me the foundational vocabulary where yeah. I'm able to jump into a whole nother realm that I have no idea what's going on. But if I can get into the glossary and I can learn the, the, the vocabulary, then at least I can walk the walk and I can ask more intelligent questions and my world starts to open up because I now know how to ask what. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually, that's one of the best answers I've ever heard to that question. My, my, my friend. Um, oh, good. all Cheers. right. <laughs> yeah. So a uh, couple of last questions. I, I, these, I'm excited to ask you these. So we fast forward to the very end of your life. This, this amazing life, uh, that, that you've lived this, this self prescribed life that you've, you've engineered. Um, but we're at the end of it and we're at your funeral and a loved one is reading your eulogy and they're allowed to, uh, of course they're going to say, you know, all kinds of things, but let's say they're constrained to only pick three words, three descriptors to describe Travis, to describe the life that you lived. And when they share with everybody in attendance about you, they can only choose three descriptors to describe you. What three words do you hope they choose? Well, the first three that came to my mind, and yeah. you can edit this, but was, sure. he fucking lived. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Maybe we I should have a more PG. Uh, no, that's PG. great, man. Yeah. Unfiltered, unfiltered. <laughs> That could also be one of the best answers to that question I've, I've ever gotten. Um, and then uh, second to last question is, if you have a magic wand, Travis, and you, you've been all over the world, you've done so many things, and you've seen the good, the bad, and then the ugly, I'm sure, with, you know, with, with, our, with the world in which we live today, if you could wave that magic wand tonight, and we wake up tomorrow, and the world is different in one way, like you with this magic wand have changed the world in one way you know, material way, the world is different in the way we experience it. When we wake up tomorrow, how is the world different? According to Travis, I'd probably take away media. I, I think that uh, when we watch the media and we hear that this country or this person is a bad guy or, you know, they're bad people, that's not always the case. And I think that the majority of media is just propaganda. They're just making sales. And yeah. I just got back from China a couple of weeks ago because, you know, everybody says, oh, we're going to war with China. So I thought, OK, let me go check. And I don't think we're going to war with China. I think that the media um, could be one of the first things that yeah. um, maybe gets uh, a V2. <laughs> Well, one, um, you gave some of the best answers to those, the last three questions I asked, because those are the standard questions I ask at, a, at the end of every interview. And I, I just like your stories, amazing answers. The most important question, Travis, is after people hear this, they are going to want to, I am going to, so I know they're going to want to follow your story and just be part of your journey. I can only imagine it's only going to get better from here. So how do people connect with you? How do they follow you? You know, how, how do they be part of your story? 
Well, yeah, I I have a website, travisrosbach.com, T-R-A-V-I-S-R-O-S-B-A-C-H.com. And I'm also on LinkedIn under travisrosbach.com. Those are the two main ways. I, I really don't do much social media, really. Okay. Well, we'll put that in the show notes, too, so that people can connect with you and, and, um, and then definitely go to your website to check it out. I just want to tell you... Um, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I literally, I don't think I've laughed this much in an interview, interviewing somebody and had so much genuine fun. And, and truth to be said, brother, I have three pages of notes of which I think I read the intro and then not a single, because you just, the story just unfolded. Like it's just, you're a master storyteller and it was so much fun. So I love that. I love that, man. Thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate you. I, I, I thank you so much, Roger. That that means a lot to me. That that's amazing. You've had some wonderful guests. I love listening to your show. So that that's that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to the Thrive More Podcast. Don't forget to take a look at the show notes for any of the resources that we mentioned during the podcast. And if you haven't already, be sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on your notifications so you have access to the latest and the greatest. You can connect with me on any of the socials at Real Roger Martin. And be sure to check out our website, thrivemorebrands.com. There you'll find information on the brands we support and information on franchising. Thanks again for tuning in.